So they're saying that pets are the new children and plants are the new pets. I totally get that. I totally agree. I treat my plants like they're children and I treat my pet like it's a child as well. However, there are things you need to know if you're going to choose to have pet babies and plant babies. Plants can be toxic to pets. So today's video is going to go over everything you need to know to have your pet babies and your plant babies live in harmony together. Hello, plant friends. I'm Maria. I am your new best plant friend, and I'm here to talk about pets and plants, right? I've done multiple episodes on this topic on my podcast, Growing Joy with Plants. Not only plants that work well that are non-toxic for our pets, but some techniques that I've learned over the years from my different interviews on the podcast and just speaking to a lot of people who have dogs and cats. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I am a proud bird mom. I have a little yellow parakeet named Frankie, who's the light of my life, but he came second. My plants were my first pet right? I cared for them. And then Frankie came second. I'm lucky that Frankie doesn't really interact with my houseplants. But I know that if you have cats or dogs, this can be a real issue, even children sometimes, because although our you know dogs and our pets can look really beautiful in a photo together, a lot of our common houseplants are toxic to pets. And if you have a pet that is going to get into your plants, there are definitely some things you need to know, tactics and a list of plants that you should not be buying for your home if you're going to have pets. So let's get into it. So first off, I think it's really important. I've talked to thousands of plant parents at this point in my community of podcast listeners and, and YouTube watchers. And I think I want to give a disclosure that no matter what type of pet and plant parent you are, you should always consult with the ASPCA. You can go to, I believe, ASPCA.org or the Pet Poison Hotline. We're going to put both of those links below. So before you make your choice, this is just a little disclaimer that I'm giving you suggestions. I'm sharing stories that I've heard and learned over my, you know, almost a decade of caring for plants, but arm yourself with the information. And it's always super easy before you're buying a plant to just go on ASPCA and just check to see the level of toxicity. Because what I have found is pet owners really approach plant care and what plants they keep in a multitude of different ways, because it's really about knowing your pet. For example, my bird doesn't go near my plants, so I'm not really worried about having toxic plants in his environment. He might fly around, but he's not nibbling on them. A lot of people have dogs or cats that don't really interact with their plants at all. So they have floors filled with monstera, philodendron, diffenbachia, all the plants that are super toxic on the do not buy list for pet owners. They don't care because they know their pet and they know this isn't going to be an issue. Then there are pet plants. Plants and pets, these words are so, they're so close. I'm going to keep messing them up in this video. Then there are pet owners that have the toxic plants, but they put them, they hang them from the ceiling. They put them in high shelves. They keep them out of reach. They even have rooms that are closed off that their pets aren't allowed into where they keep their toxic plants. They have the toxic plants, but they just separate them from their pets. And then there are plant parents that are like, no way. I'm getting a dog. I'm going to give away all my toxic plants and I'm not going to buy any more. And I think based on your pet, any of those options make sense, right? You got to know your pet. You got to know yourself because you don't want to have crazy amounts of anxiety if you have a cat and you have a monstera and you're going to be so scared every day about like managing the cat and the monstera. It's not worth it to have the monstera, right? It's worth it to just get the right plants that your cat can interact with and you not be stressed about it because plant care shouldn't be a stressful hobby. It should be a joyful hobby. That's what we're doing here, right? We're growing joy. So my first tip is know your plant. Know your pet. Oh my gosh, this video is going to be tricky to get through. It? <laughs> know your pet and know your plants. So I have filled this table with gorgeous, lush, tropical plants that are totally safe to your pets on the ASPCA website. But I think before we go into all the different types of plants that you can have, I think it's important first to talk about a couple of really cool techniques that I've learned from different pet owners on different interviews I've done on the podcast about if you have a toxic plant or if you just have pets that like get into your plants and you're finding soil strewn around your floors, there's a couple of cool techniques that you can use to kind of teach your pets to stay out of your plants. So first off, something I thought that was interesting, one of the first interviews I did on the podcast was with a cat owner about cats and plants. And what she does is she takes river rocks or stones and she puts them in the soil of her planters. So let's take this money plant, Pachira aquatica, for example, totally safe plant for pets. She puts river stones on the surface of the soil. 
And the river stones, she says her cat doesn't like the feeling of the river stones on its paws. So when it goes to kind of dig in the soil, it stops because it doesn't like the river stones. You can also do this with tin foil if aesthetics is not too much of a stressor for you. People have put tin foil in their soil and they don't like the sound and the feeling of the tin foil on their paws. I've also heard of people taking toothpicks and making like a little fence of toothpicks around their planter because I don't think the toothpick is really going to hurt the paws so much. I don't know if I would do that <laughs> if I had a dog or a cat, but I know friends who just put like little little fences of toothpicks. But there are multiple options like this that are all about training your pets to just stay off of your plants, right? Sometimes it's just a behavior that you have to train them out of. And just kind of some sort of simple interference like this is possible. I ordered these online off of Amazon, but you can also just like go outside and forage for them and just clean them up. Moss might be fun for a pet to play around with, but you could also try moss, but anything that's going to deter. So when it comes to pest deterrence, what I have heard is the holy grail product is this Granix Bitter Apple Spray. Like I said, I don't have a dog or a cat, so I haven't used it, but I've, I've heard from so many people that I ended up ordering it for this video and I thought we could spray it together, see if it has a smell. But apparently this is made a powerful taste deterrent invented by a pharmacist in 1960. So it's okay for a dog or a cat to eat, but it has a taste that the dog doesn't like. So what will happen is the dog or the cat will take an exploratory bite and not like the taste and then know to not go back, right? So I was thinking it would be fun. It says you're supposed to shake this. So you would take your plant, you would, sh you would spray it on the leaves and then kind of wait for the dog or the cat to come bite it and learn its lesson. But once again, this is about training a behavior out of your pet so that they leave the plants alone. There is no smell to this. I'm going to smell it. Yeah, there's absolutely no smell to this. So I could see because sometimes I feel like with these pest deterrent sprays, they tell you like to do essential oils or stuff that can like be kind of smelly. No smell to this whatsoever. Apparently, they'll take a bite. They won't like it and they'll move on. So we'll link to this in case you want it. There are multiple types of pest deterrent sprays that you're more than welcome to try. I've also heard citrus work. So like if you just spray some lemon juice and water and spray on your plants, I've heard that works too. So that might be a way, a way for you to manage it just from pulling it out of your crisper wherever you keep your citrus. So those are some techniques for training your pet's behavior. But if you have a pet who is just going to get into all of your stuff, right? If you have a pet that is going to be exploring and getting in. The other thing with exploring is Megan, the girl who was on our episode with cats and plants said, there's a difference between pets eating a plant and taking an exploratory bite. They might take a nibble where they don't even chew it. You're going to see like little bite marks in a leaf and not. For her, she kind of allows that. And then there's difference between, you know, a dog or a cat, like completely eating, eating an entire plant, which no one wants. So know that the most toxic plants, we'll put a list of most toxic plants on the screen. You're going to want to stay away from Diffenbachia, Monstera, sadly. Monstera are such a common houseplant and philodendron. Those are like two super common houseplants and pothos. Those are all going to be toxic to your pets. So, you know, proceed at your own caution if you have those plants, maybe put them higher up, maybe spray them down with the spray, right? But be careful. But there's a ton of plants that are super safe for your pets, right? So some of the plants that we have go from kind of smallest to largest. Spider plants. Spider. This is the babyest spider plant I've ever seen. But you can get huge hanging baskets of spider plants that you can hang they grow pups. And I've heard that actually cats will use them as like little play toys with the little pups that start dangling and hanging out. Totally safe. Ferns. Now, ferns are, you know, you have to have the right scenario. You have to have the right home environment to have a fern thrive. We have a whole care video on ferns if you're interested. But ferns are totally safe for pets, right? So we have bird's nest ferns, blue wave ferns, uh, crispy wave ferns. There's so many different types of beautiful ferns that your pet can, you know, nuzzle to its heart's desire. Peperomia, another great pet safe plant. This is the watermelon, variegated watermelon peperomia. I couldn't believe this was at the plant store when I was shopping for plants for this video. This is the variegated peperomia. I mean, there are so many peperomia varieties. This is my other favorite, silver frost. Um, there are so many varieties of peperomia that can come very small or you can get really big, you know, eight inch, eight inch planters of that are so beautiful. You could have an entire plant collection of peperomia and have the most lush, lush collection. Calathea, any, any type of prayer plants also safe for pets. So 
Calathea come in so many different varieties. We have a staghorn from over there. Pachira aquatica, money plant. Another more finicky plant. So I would say level 2.0 plant if, if you're a pet, pet and plant parent. Super safe, beautiful. You can get these really big. So a complaint that I hear from pet parents is I want a really big plant in my house that is pet safe because a lot of our really big plants are those monsteras or philodendrons or ficus. All of these plants are toxic. So I introduce you to the palm. The palm family is safe for plants, right? So if you want an epic, you know, statement plant to be on your floor and be really tall, go grab yourself a palm. And if you want to know about the palm, we have an entire episode on the podcast all about palm care. I mean, it doesn't get more jungly than this, right? So if you have a monstera and you're looking for a larger plant as an alternative, I think a palm is a great option. It's so epic and amazing. So we've got small plants, we've got big plants, and then we have blooming plants, a lot of blooming pants, pants. A lot of blooming plants are pet safe. So we have the African violet, right? We have the orchid pet safe. You can fill your house with blooms and grow joy with blooms with your pet. Hoya also are safe for pets. And Hoya have a variety of blooms that are also scented. I just got a Maxillaria tenifolia, which is the coconut orchid. And it's not in bloom right now, but apparently when it blooms, the bloom smells like coconut. I have it in my office. I'm so excited for it to bloom and then just fill my office with the scent of pina colada. I cannot wait. And I think that's about it. Do you have pets and plants? Do you have a dog or a cat? I don't have a dog or a cat. Obviously, these are tips that I've just pulled from my dog and cat friends. But if I missed any, I'd love to hear how you exist with your pet babies and your plant babies successfully. Drop your comments below. Like, subscribe, thumbs up this video. Tell the YouTube gods that, you know, we're making good content for you. DM me pictures of your pets and your plants at Growing Joy with Maria. I want to see pictures of your pets and I want to see pictures of your plants. Please, I get to go hang out with my dog nephew, Birdie, later today. I'm so excited. I hope this video was helpful and I hope it helps you grow joy with your pets and your plants.